our last speaker of Campus Party and closing this year's edition, it's Nicolas Alcala, talking about the Cosmonaut, his latest project. Thank you. Well, um, does anybody of you know about the Cosmonaut? Have you heard about the film? Any of you? No? One over there, three, okay. That's good. So I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna tell you things that you don't know. That's really good. Well, The Cosmonaut, um, it's a feature film, but it's not only a feature film. I'm gonna tell you about why it, is, it became such a big project. It was uh, just a film at the beginning. That was four years ago when we had the idea of telling a film about The Cosmonaut, which is, for the ones of you who don't know, it's the Russian astronauts are called cosmonauts. Uh, four years ago, we started this project, and the question I get the more, or the most, uh, and that's why I want to get rid of the pink elephant in the room because this is the like the you know the question everybody asks me is uh, this was a crowdfunding project and everyone everybody wants to know how much money did we raise so let's get rid of the pink elephant. We raised 420,000 euros through crowdfunding. Uh, this was huge because it allowed us to make a really big project. Uh, being really small, we were a really, really small production company uh, with a lot of innovation on it that would have been impossible on a traditional film. So let me tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, let me introduce myself. This is me, I'm Nicholas. Uh, I could say I'm a director, a film director, but I prefer the term storyteller because it's not only films that I direct and it's not only... Uh, you know, it's stories what I like to, to tell uh, in any way. In, that means that I can tell a story through a film, but also can tell a story through a short film or through an image or through an uh, audio file or any kind of media because that's how uh, new, you know, new narratives are about, about telling stories through all kinds of different media. Six years ago, I founded my own production company with my two partners, Bruno and Carola. It's called Riot Cinema Collective. Uh, and when we were studying at university, I read this book, which is a fantastic book that you should read, even though if you're not film fanatics, because it's a f book that tells the story of the new generation of Hollywood. Uh, for the ones of you who don't know about them, it's all that bunch of guys that arrived to Hollywood with their Hawaiian shirts, bird food, with a long bird, and took over the place. They are called Coppola, Spielberg, Scorsese. You know, all those guys, they arrived to Hollywood to a very traditional industry and decided to start doing things in a different way. And I read this book about their story, and it really inspired me. You know, while I was reading, I was saying to myself, I want to live that. I want to be part of that kind of generation that, you know, change things, does, that do things differently, like the Nouvelle Bag did in the 60s, like, I don't know, that many others. So we started to think how to make our film. We were three students, 21-year-old students, uh, with no connections to the industry whatsoever, but with no money, no support, no nothing. And we started to think how we were going to make our film and we were going to try to adapt to a lot of things that were happening around us with YouTube, with Facebook, with the internet, with piracy, with all the things that were happening uh, related to film. So basically what we wanted, uh, first of all, was fame, the three Fs, fame, fortune, and no, I'm kidding. What we wanted was to tell stories. That was our main goal. That was what we really, really wanted. And we didn't care uh, about how. We didn't, it's like, you know, 10 years ago, when you wanted to make a film, you needed $1 million, a lot of people behind it. Uh, you need a lot of things. Making films is a really, really expensive activity. I always say that, you know, filmmakers and architects are, it's the worst professions in the world because, you know, if you're a musician, you can play music. If you're a writer, you can write on a you know, napkin. Uh, if you're a painter, you can draw. If you're a filmmaker, you cannot do films. You need a million dollars. It's really expensive. So. Basically, we wanted to tell stories and we didn't care. And we didn't care because five years ago, we got a rare disease, which is called reality distortion field. Uh, it's a very special disease. Many people have had it over time. And basically, it's a disease that makes you 
want to change everything, to turn everything upside down, to rethink, rewrite, re absolutely everything, uh, which is kind of cool on one hand. But on the other hand, it's pretty difficult because uh, it makes you face everything uh, and go against almost everything, and that gives you very little support and basically no money with the tr from the traditional industries, which is kind of difficult. But we didn't care again because we wanted to tell stories. So uh, we were called fools, we were called crazy. We, they said to us that we were out of our minds because basically what we wanted to do was to make a film with no no money from, you know, in Spain, if you don't have a government loan, you can't make a film. But we wanted to make a film without that kind of money. Uh, we wanted to make a film and to distribute it the way we as audience were watching films. That is, online, on every kind of media, being able to decide where and when and how to watch it. And not only that, but also in a very special way, not only making a 90-minute feature, feature film, a 90 minute feature film, but to make an expansive story, something that went beyond the 90-minute uh, stories. So, because we wanted to tell stories, we discovered something. We discovered these three things. We discovered that uh, while we were trying to make the film, we discovered that when you have funding from any kind, from the government or from a production company or from anywhere, that, you know, it's a lack of creative freedom. Because that money will probably need to be profitable. So, you know, the people giving you the money is going to tell you how to spend it. And that's really bad if you're a creator. The other thing we found out is that distribution back then and still now uh, wasn't really, really getting what the audience were asking for. You know, piracy exists not because we are all really bad people that want to fuck up the industries. It exists because, you know, what distributors are, uh, or the way distributors are giving you the films doesn't match how the people is consuming those films. And there needs, you know, it's eventually there will be a match when they start giving the people the films the way they want it. And the other thing that we discovered, does anyone know who this guy is? Anyone guess? No? Okay, see, he's Aristotle. He's the one, basically he's the guy, great guy that invented uh, narrative three-act structure, you know, beginning, a middle, and an end, and how traditional stories basically work. But again, as I told you, we had this need to restructure and rethink everything and to turn it upside down. So we decided to first invent or try to seek a way of funding uh, that gave us that creative freedom. That was crowdfunding, because you know, all these people that gave us their money to make this project allowed us to do whatever we wanted to do. They trusted us. And that's why we had complete creative freedom, which is something that I will want probably have as a director uh, in my future career. So I was really, really glad that I had this chance. The other thing we did was to, because also because we had this kind of money and nobody was telling us how to do things, we were able to, you know, meet the audience needs on distribution. And the first thing we decided to do was to kill this guy and not to follow the traditional way of telling stories. Because usually those, that traditional way, you know, a film lasts for 90 minutes, 90 to 120 minutes, uh, series, you know, a series web episode lasts four or five minutes, or a book is 1,200 pages on average because of a physical format. It's because cinemas needed to have four films a night. Because series needed to you know, be on a TV grid that lasts for one hour every program, and they needed 15 minutes of advertisement. And the books is because it will be really difficult to print 2,000 pages or 20. But now we have something called internet, where you can put everything there. And it can have any kind of format. And as audience, we're able to explore all those formats. And that, this is an amazing thing for us creators, for us that are telling stories, because we're not limited by the format anymore. So we raised 420,000 euros from 5, 000, almost 5,000 people. Um, it was great. The project grew big. 
you know, we were invited to give conferences. There were business uh, case studies in business schools, in film schools. And this was really, really good because it allowed us to make the project we wanted. But the main thing that came out of this, it wasn't money. It wasn't the funding part of crowdfunding. It was the crowd. You know, crowdfunding means be funded by people. But the most important thing out of this was people. So basically, we were able to raise a really big community of fans and supporters that were working with us while we were making the project for four years. It was an amazing journey. It was a huge adventure. And we had a lot of people helping us in every step of the way, not only with their money, but with their support talking about the film, uh, answering our questions on Twitter every time we had a doubt or we needed to find something, uh, lending us their computers, helping us with production tasks. It was amazing to have 5,000 friends coming along with us to make a film. Let me give you an example of what having a committed community means. And I still don't know why producers are not making the... I mean, why are they waiting for the film to come out to find their audiences? When you can find them even before writing the screenplay. So one thing happened. We were one week away from the shooting. We had managed to get like 150,000 euros from crowdfunding. And we met a Russian producer. She was going to become our co-producer. But it turned out she wasn't that nice, you know, she wasn't the nice person we thought she was. And one week before the shooting, when everything was ready, when we had locating everything in, in Latvia, we had sent all the equipment to Latvia, she dropped out with the money. That was 120,000 euros less. That was half the budget. That meant that from the nine weeks we needed to shoot in Latvia, we only had money for four. We decided to go to Latvia anyway, without money to come back. But what we did was three days before living, we made a video, really honest video, telling our audience, guys, shit happens. We are fucked up. We don't have enough money to finish this film. Uh, help us out. Save the cost for now. And we didn't do anything else. We just put the video online. We packed up and get into a plane. Three days later, this is what we lost. Three days later, we had raised 130,000 euros in three days, just three days. That was, you know, 600 people, our community, we had a much bigger community, telling to all, all the friends to save the cosmonaut. To save, not the cosmonaut, a film that they were supporting, to save their film. It was, you know, all the tweets were about, save my film. I'm a producer of this shit. I, I, I'm part of this. Help me out with my project. All those people wearing their t-shirts, they were talking about their film. That was amazing. 5,000 people. You know, the credits of the film last for 20 minutes. 6,000 names were in the Guinness record. But why not? It's amazing. OK, so another really, really cool thing we did, and this was the craziest thing of the project, and it gave us a lot of headaches and problems some fights with the industry, uh, we decided to license the film with Creative Commons. Does anybody not know what Creative Commons is? Okay, you all know what Creative Commons is. That's good. That's really good. Um, basically, for us, it was like, okay, so all these people are going to fund our film. Now we're going to give them the film and, and allow them to use it the way they want. Why not? So we decided to license the film in a way which was legal for people to share it, to copy it, to exhibit it, and to even remix it. This was a crazy, crazy thing. Because, you know, every time we needed to deal with the industry and to sell the film to TVs and to uh, do any kind of distribution deal, everything's based upon copyright. Everyone works upon copyright. And they were like, why am I going to pay to you if you're going to allow people to legally uh, share it? And it's like, are you crazy? And we were. But we, want, we really wanted to do this. We really wanted to give the audience for the, you know, to the people the way us as audience wanted to consume films. So the things we did around creative commons and distribution were kind of crazy. First of all, we decided to do a day and day release. That means the same day, at the same hour, we, released, we premiered the film in TV, 
in uh, movie theaters, in DVD, and on the internet. For you, the audience, to choose where to watch it and how to watch it. And maybe start watching it at home and then keep watching it in your iPad and then finish it at your at movie theater with a hundred, you know, a thousand people. A lot of people decided to go for it, to go to movie theater or to buy it on DVD because it had some added value. You know, it's not the same watching the film with 1,200 people that watching it at home in your computer. The other thing we did was to uh, put the film for free online. This was kind of crazy. But we felt that, you know, since it was paid by all the people on the internet, we owe them that. So we put the film free online. You, were you actually are able to watch it for free on our website. The only thing we asked you to do was to share it, share it to view. You just need to log into Facebook or Twitter and tell the world that you're about to watch the film. If you like it, you can decide how much to pay. Could be nothing, or you can pay, what, you can pay whatever you feel it's right. If you pay about five euros, you're going to get access to the K-Pass, K-Program. That's our special club where you ha you'll have access to a ton of additional content. All the webisodes, um, special things, a book, a lot of stuff, really cool stuff. So we decided to go for added value, you know, to give the film for free, but to give to the audience something else that would make them pay. And first, you know, in last of all, the other thing we did, and this was the first time this was done in history, was to since the film, since the license allowed people to remix the film, we didn't want the people only to remix the 90-minute feature. We, want them, we wanted them to remix everything. So we put online 140 hours of footage, like everything we have shot, images, sound, uh, absolutely everything. 140 hours of uh, good and bad takes, of rockets, of uh, uh, transition shots, everything. So they could not only remix it and make their own cut of the film, but also use that on their, you know, other works, like on a short film or on a music clip or whatever. And a lot of things started to happen around this, even before releasing the film. For example, there was a music company in Germany that was in love about, uh, was in love with the film, and they decided to ask their 20 bands to co to make each one of them a song inspired by the film or by the screenplay, because this was before shooting. They made a beautiful record that they sold. So they were reaching their community with a new idea about, you know, a soundtrack, alternative soundtrack about the cosmonaut. They were reaching our community that fell in love with the, with the idea of a, an alternative soundtrack. But more than that, from this uh, record they created, then we took all those songs and we used them to create the short films. And that was, it ended up being the soundtrack of part of the film. So in the end, you know, all this remix thing was about creating new things and, and you know, uh, producing new stuff. And that, that was also amazing. The last thing we, we decided to do was to uh, turn the film into a transmedia project. As I told you, um, we decided to kill Aristotle and to just go further from the traditional way that films were made. because. You know, we felt in a way there was, during history, we, we, we had a lot of, uh, you know, lacks of freedom, a lot of, it was really difficult to, uh, you need to adapt really to a very, very conservative format. But now we were able to go free and to decide when and how and in which ways to tell our story. And this is something that has been, you know, there's people been doing this for years. At some point, George Lucas decided to make Star Wars, and instead of doing one film, he created the universe. It wasn't just one film. There was six films plus three more that they're about to make, but suddenly there was a whole universe to be explored. There were books, there were video games, there were uh, mm, comic books. You know, it's like, if you like Star Wars, you're gonna be crazy about it because you can explore a lot of stories surrounding this idea. And this is what we wanted. So now we have the opportunity to use any screen uh, to tell a story and to use any media. And 
maybe a part of your story is better told through an image or an audio file or a phone call among characters or any other thing. Before you couldn't do it, but now you can. You can explore all these possibilities. So basically, this is the, uh, how I wrote the screenplay for the film. Usually us as screenwriters, we have a lot of ideas, a lot of you know, small things that we write down and then we put them on a wall sometimes uh, and then we decide how to tell the story or which parts are going to get into a final screenplay. And with all the information you don't use, then you throw it away. But why should you do that? Now we can use all this information and tell more stories. That's why we decided not to make only a film, but to make 36 short films around the feature film and a book and a Facebook fiction. The thing is, there is one lesson that they taught me in film school. Uh, it's the first lesson, you know, it's uh, directing 101, which is this. Go Kevin Smith. This is the first thing they tell you. It's like, dude, if you're going to make a film and you have barely no money and your first film, uh, you know, this is your first film, make it easy. Make clerks. Six guys, one location, $30,000. That's easy. That's how you make a film. That's how you make your life easy to make a film. But we were crazy. As I told you, we had this disease and we needed to make the crazy thing. So we decided to instead do a film which is set up in the 70s uh, in Russia, shot in English with a ton of special effects, uh, shot in three countries with 120 locations, a lot of characters, uh, a team of 40 people. It was kind of not the easiest way to make your first film. But we survived, and we ended up doing 36 short films that will allow you as audience to explore the universe we created about the space race, about uh, that historical period, about cosmonauts, how they train, what they did, how were the military decisions, uh, and about the characters, how they met, how they uh, managed to fight or not fight or flirt or whatever. And then we made a short film that explained the things that in the film remain unexplained. You know, a lot of people, at, by the end of the film, they ask me, uh, so in the end, he, is he, he, does he do that or he, did he arrive there? And, you know, many of those questions are answered in this short film. And then we did a Facebook fiction during six weeks with 11 characters that you could follow and friend and watch them interact, live for th six weeks in their regular lives, just flirting and posting pictures in this experimental 70s uh, PC network they were, they were experimenting with. And you could also interact with them, create a profile, and just become a character of this uh, space race. Uh, and we also made a book that explained a whole bunch of other things. And instead of doing a regular DVD, boring plastic DVD, we made a book with a DVD. And so that was our added value. Even though the film was for free, you, if you bought the DVD, you had the book, so all kinds of stuff. Um, the final result of this is that we premiered the film three months ago. And I'm going to show you the trailer, because one of the, most, one of the funniest things that happened to me is that everyone was expecting, you know, it's a one million dollar feature film uh, done with even less money because we only got like half of that. Um, made by three really young people seeking money from the internet. So everyone was expecting like a YouTube film. You know, everyone was expecting a shitty film that looked like uh, amateur. When we released the trailer, there were a lot of uh, jaws dropping. I had a lot of fun. And this is basically the film we managed to make. Oh, what? Sorry. What's happening? Where's the image? Okay. Sorry about that.
my third orbit of the moon. Isn't she beautiful? Okay, so um, I think we are in the verge of something really, really, really exciting. I think us as filmmakers, but not only filmmakers, but storytellers, every one of you that is telling a story, even though if you work at a company and you do all, all the kind of things, uh, we are living in a period of time where we can tell our stories personally. We can engage people with our stories. We can create communities. We can do a lot of things that we, did, we couldn't do 10 years ago. I think we're in a really, really exciting time. Uh, and we need to you know, be responsible for that and, and use all the tools that we have in our hands uh, to communicate and to create new projects and to do it with as many people as possible, you know, the more the merrier. So thank you so much. Uh, that was everything. Just I'm open for any questions you might have. Hi. Hi. Of all the various remixes that have been made using the footage that you put up online, do you have a favorite? Okay, um, we haven't received any, any uh, remix of the film yet, as a whole. Uh, we did a remix context two years ago with the trailer, the first trailer we released, and that was amazing. We received like 150 remixes from all around the world, you know, people remixing the trailer. Uh, I'm still waiting for the film remixes or a new cut of the film. I think that will happen. We're not going to try to uh, give all this footage, it's, it's two terabytes of footage, to film schools. Because, you know, as a when I was a student, when I was, you know, studying editing at university, I've had the opportunity to, rem you know, to, to cut a film from scratch, from, you know, having all the footage and having the final version made by the director. I think that's a great, great opportunity for it because usually they give you a film or a scene and they ask you to just recut it, but that's not how you edit. You know, you need to watch the whole thing. Uh, I think, you know, the first time I watched this 100 remixes of the trailer, the most amazing thing was how many different visions there could be about the same idea. There were people making it more poetic. There were people making action trailers. There were, it was really inspiring to see how, how many different thing, things you can make. I think the best um, remix, in a way, of the things that we've created it's a book that actually came before the film. Um, I was writing the, the story of the cosmonaut, and I didn't kind of know how to continue with the story and how to develop the characters. And I, I entered a library, and I said to myself, I'm not going to live here until I find a book that talks about cosmonauts. And I found, like, after two minutes, 
I found a very small poetry book called Poetics for Cosmonauts. That was exactly what I was looking for. It was a uh, three friends love story, a love triangle among cosmonauts. And I met the author. We fell in love with each other, with our work, and he fell in love with the film. And since the first edition had run out, we decided to re-edit it. And it was beautiful because on my screenplay, I put a lot of the poetry book, lines and ideas and things. And when we made the second edition, the writer decided to rewrite some of the poems and to add some things that I had written for the screenplay. So it was kind of a ping, creative ping pong among those two things. So if you read the second edition, it has a lot of the film. The film has a lot of the first edition. It was a really beautiful way of remixing content. And I ended up writing the second part of the book, which is the book that we are selling with the DVD. Hi. Um, what I didn't get really was how you started building the community in the beginning, because, OK, you have 4,500 people donating. That's great. but. How did you get them to pique your interest with this the, the poetic book? Was it like draft from that that piqued their interest? Or what did you give them so they felt that like it was interesting to invest their five euros or whatever they wanted to invest? OK. Uh, I think it, at the beginning, we just had uh, a website with a draft of the screenplay. When we launched the project, we didn't have the, the final screenplay. That came like a year later. Uh, I think this. I always say that we've made two films. One is about the Soviet cosmonaut that gets lost in space, whatever. The other film, it's about three friends willing to make a film with no resources and willing to do a crazy thing that was this project. And I think what made people get involved with the project wasn't the space story. Maybe a 10% of the people were space freaks and they loved the idea. But I think most of the people got involved because uh, they wanted to be part of this story and we told them the story in like episodes during four years through our uh, blog through our social networks through our videos we were really really transparent we told them everything about the process the things that went right the things that went wrong uh, so it was about in a way uh, being part of this story I think that's what made people to commit to the project there was a question here Hi. Um, first of all, thanks for the talk and congratulations on such an Thank amazing, amazing achievement. Thank you. Um, the thing that I'm always interested in with like remix projects, like we all, I think, as artists, want other people to use what we make and make something else. Um, even so, the question of not necessarily ownership but authorship comes into it. Like, who is the author of, like, for example, the like. I just want to know how you conceive of like the short films that were made from your footage and uh, like the remixes of your trailer. Like, like how do you conceive of your authorship in those remixes? Do you feel like some connection to them, or do you think they're just the product of whoever made them, whoever remixed? I think that's. I think Creative Commons handles that very, very well. That's why every Creative Commons license, uh, it's you know the only thing that remains in the, four, in the six licenses is the buy, that you need to attribute the work to the original author. So in a way, you know, I think every new piece of art, it's uh, the, the owner or the, the creator is the guy that created it. But if you got inspired by someone else or someone else's material, you should just say it. So it's about, it could be, you know, this short film is directed by uh, John Doe, but it's, it used. Uh, Nicholas Alcala's footage, for example. So I think that's that's good. It's you know it's how art work. Basically, you get inspired by other people, and it could be a guy that made something 400 years ago, or it could be a guy that made it yesterday. And usually, you don't acknowledge that, or you do. You know, it's when 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 some critic says uh, this film looks like a Tarkovsky film. It's that's a remix in a way, you know. It's like it's creating new things out of. Cause there's no nothing is original. You just remodel it or reshape it to make it look different. So I'm not r really that worried about authorship. Uh, I think it's important to acknowledge who created the original thing, and then just feel free to create new things. And you know, as many new things there are, the better. Um. This 
Oh, oh. Okay. sorry. Hmm? Um, 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 regarding what you said about narrative, I'm curious. Uh, within the story that is told in the feature film, to what extent were you able to subvert the traditional narrative structure, narrative tropes you were mentioning before in the presentation? Okay, that, w that was difficult because we were really um, diving into the dark, like not knowing how to tell, you know, we, we usually with the story, a traditional story, you have some... Uh, points where you can grab and, and move forward like okay this is the first act this is the second one this is with this was much more difficult we spent seven months in the editing room with a lot of material usually for a film you have 20 30 hours we had 140 um, so basically in the end what I decided to do is to make a feature film which was just a part of the whole so that's why it, that is frustrating for me because many people just watch the feature film and it's like, okay, I, I didn't really get it. Or uh, it's like, I don't understand why it has this weird structure. And I will say that, you know, instead of following the traditional narrative structure, what I follow, because that's what the film's about, was the structure of dreams. It's more chaotic, it's more uh, onirical. It's what you just need to enjoy and dive into that. and. The narrative part, like like the development of the narrative, you will get it by watching the whole 36 uh, short films and the book. And this happened to me. You know, the people that, that maybe didn't they didn't enjoy the film so much when they watched the whole thing, they ended up loving the film and having the feeling that there was a story that had been told along all this. So it was kind of difficult, and I I. I really can't explain how we did it because it was just, you know, out of, it was so new and so it was just out of pure instinct. So, uh, I don't know, it was a good experience to, to change for a while new things. Congratulations on the amazing achievements, really Thank you. amazing, incredible project. Um, in, from your presentation, I see that something like Kickstarter, like I think you used Kickstarter, right? No. Oh, you didn't, sorry. No, so uh, which actually, one did you use? Uh, none. <laughs> this is a funny story. When we started, there were only two platforms in the world. Now there are thousands. They were just Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And they were born three months before we started with this. So they didn't allow projects from abroad. No, if, uh, Kickstarter done, uh, don't allow them now, but Indiegogo that then uh, opened, they didn't allow them. So we decided to make our own platform. We made a store and we put all our merchandise out there. And this was really good because it allowed us to keep the campaign open for four years instead of 30 days. And that's what, how we managed to get that amount of money. Okay, cool. So uh, it's funny how I even assumed right there. Um, so what could could you could you indicate for people who want to tell a transmedia story like this? Um, what is something that is out there currently that would really help them? And what do you see from your experience as at the moment really missing in this new way of, of telling your story? Okay, uh, about resources, I think there are very few, and this is a shame, but there are very few media projects yet to, to look for. There are few people doing cool stuff, uh, but very few yet. Um, I think the best way to understand what are the possibilities of a transmedia project is to watch series. You know, any HBO series, any of the cool series we're watching nowadays, they are about developing the characters, developing the story. They are about what I try to do, which is create a whole universe. You know, if you watch The Wire or The West Wing or any of those, they, are, they created the whole universe. About um, resources, um, that's difficult too. So there are very few. And I think what's lacking is the distribution platforms. You know, for us, that was the main problem. It's like, okay, I go to a TV network and I tell them that they have a story and they like it and they want to buy it. But then what I told them is that my story is told through 36 short films and a film and a book, and they don't know what to do anymore. It's like, ah, uh, um, okay, we're gonna pay you for the film. Yeah, okay, but you know, people just gonna watch the film and what about the rest? It's like if you just screen a film and just screen half of it. Yeah, well, but uh, mm, that's it. Movie theaters the same. 
the only uh, in the end the only place where it was good to screen the, and have the whole experience was the internet. And the problem is not even the VOD platforms were uh, able to do that. It was like, okay, guys, can we put just make a website on your VOD platform and have the film and the 30? No. Okay, cool. So we decided to build our own again. So we built our own website, really, really cool website. Um, um, the least we can do, what well, we could do to help other people solve this kind of problem was to put all the code, all the programming out there for free as free software. So you can grab our website, change the colors, change the text, and have a distribution platform for your trust media project. Hi. Uh, we are really interested in this uh, movie. Uh, so we decided to uh, play it at the bus when we travel to our home. So, what now? I saw the website, play it online. Mm, I don't have uh, SIM cards for whole Europe, sorry. So, how to download it now and Bit play it later? BitTorrent. Yeah, I don't, have, uh, I don't have torrents in my iPad, sorry. <laughs> you can buy the DVD, you can... Uh, Do you have some DVDs there? No, not here, but you can buy them online. And uh -huh. we'll ship them to uh, anywhere. And uh, where can I uh, buy it online? Uh, you don't have on iTunes? At our website. Everything's on our website. We have a really cool website. Uh, I didn't find the link. It's Download the film. Cosmonautexperience.com. Uh, we, di we, we didn't allow the download link in, like, you know, direct download, because I, th I think that was a little bit against our model, which, you know, we wanted people to share it. Because that's how we grow the community. No problem. I will share it. I will Which pay cool. a few euros, but I want to download it. But you can do it on BitTorrent. I mean, it's, just, it's really <laughs> easy. It's really open. You can, if you want to download it, you can go to BitTorrent. Or you can pay for it on Vimeo, and Vimeo allows you to download it. If you want it for free, you, you can watch it via streaming or website or download it via BitTorrent. You know, it's kind of easy. It's not the openest of them all. You know, it's like there isn't a link just to download for free and that's it. That's the only thing we didn't do. We, so we might do it eventually. Or you can put, you, you can build, a, you actually can build a website with no advertising, with a download button that says download and host it on your website because the license allows you to do that if you don't have advertising. We didn't do it, but you can do it. So thank you for interesting movie. <laughs> Thanks. Any more questions? By the way, you can organize screenings of the film. We have a map on our website where you can organize screenings. You can uh, well, watch it for free, whatever. Sorry, it's me again. Um, I just wondered, because the Cosmonaut is something that's just going to keep growing, keep developing, when you move on to your next project, are you going to have to leave some people behind, like sort of like keeping control of the Cosmonaut community? Because obviously it's something that is just going to keep going and going. You're staring at the last man. Everybody <laughs> left. I'm the last guy that's right. <laughs> standing here. Uh, it's, you know, one of the most difficult things about this project is that we, we spent four years without getting any money from this project. Almost 200 people work on the project. They didn't get paid. They will eventually. We managed to sell the film. We will pay them back. But um, at some point... Once we had released a film in Spain, it was a huge, massive premiere with 1,200 people, beautiful, then in Barcelona. It was really good. But, you know, all these people that have been working for such a long time, they needed to move to other projects. So basically, in the end, this is me. The, I'm handling most of, you know, I have a guy helping me out with uh, social media. Uh, we do have and have. Uh, and I'm handling all, all the contracts, all the distribution deals. I'm traveling to festivals. Uh, it's difficult because, as you said, I, I want to move to other projects. But the good thing is that now, is, you know, I've been working on this for eight hours a day for four years. But now I can work a couple of hours a day and the rest spend it moving to, uh, towards new projects. And at some point, you know, maybe in a year, I just will let it live online, whatever it happens. Like, you know, it's like when um, programmers, they build a program and at some point they just abandon the code there and just allow anyone to pick it up and do whatever. It's, it's difficult. It's, it's a good question.
Hello. Hi. Um, one little question. Um, this kind of uh, fundraising movie production, how long you think this will function in the future? For the next 10 years? Oh, that's the worst question. I mean, it's a good question, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the most difficult to answer. Uh, because I'm, I'm, uh, I have a problem is that I'm really honest and I can't lie. So I can't really sell the concept of crowdfunding as the future of funding for... Fun. No, it's not going to work like that. There's not going to be another cosmonaut in the next five years in Spain, probably. And luckily... Uh, I think crowdfunding is going to work for small projects, like, you know, up to 30,000 euros if you have a record uh, or a book or a short film or small projects, they can work. They can really work. For big films, it's not going to work for the moment. You know, to rise half a million dollars, being no one, not being Veronica Mars producers, they rise... From, Six million, not being Spike Lee, not being you know, not being a popular face. It's a four-year effort of 200 people, and that's you know, economically, it's not worth it. Um, but I think it's you know what, what I'm taking out of crowdfunding. I won't maybe do it again, but what I'm taking is, as I said, the crowd. It's like you can build a community before making the film, and that needs to remain. That's how the future of film is gonna be. Uh, in 10 years and in 20, because now every, you know, we are connected. We can do that. We can uh, get audiences engaged. And if there is money involved in that process, that's going to be great. I think one way to go is to, and that's something we tried, and maybe it was too soon, and we ended up having a part of this, is to, if you can engage a, a bigger, you know, a really big community, you, if you manage to have fans, you might get brands or people interested in those people to put money in. And that's an I indirect way of doing crowdfunding. We ended up having a brand that put 80,000 euros for the film because they believed in the project and they believed that their community and our community could merge and, and uh, their fans would like them to support a film like this. So I think eventually crowdfunding from brands because you have a crowd might be an option. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, guys, uh, for being here. You can watch the film for free online, and, and you can write me if you want to, to let me know what you think. Thanks. <laughs>